Hi everyone, welcome back to Monroe Live. I'm Julian Ates, I'm one of the associate engineers here at Monroe and Associates. Uh, today we're gonna take a quick look at the thermal system for the Ionic 5 uh, as it's still in the front end of the vehicle. We're gonna talk about materials, packaging, an overview of some of the components, and then this will serve as a bit of a preamble to a lengthier discussion about the thermal management system as a whole. Uh, when we get all of the components out of the vehicle, we'll be discussing the system architecture, uh, what we found, beneath the vehicle, uh, as well as what we find inside the battery pack for the thermal management there. Uh, but with that, uh, I initially wanna start by taking a look at uh, the reservoirs we have here. Uh, there is a, a separate loop for uh, the motor loop here. This is going to be the coolant that runs to the inverters, the motors uh, in both the front and the rear. This is an all wheel drive vehicle. This secondary reservoir here is for the battery loop. Uh, an interesting thing just at a first glance for this is that we have two separate reservoirs with what appears to be two separate coolant uh, types. In the Rivian R1T, we had a very similar setup with an energy storage system or ESS loop and then a powertrain loop which handled the inverters, uh, the motors and all of that, which was all uh, driven by this single reservoir supplied by a single reservoir with one type of coolant. So as of this stage, we are unsure as to why there would be a decision to move to two different types of coolant, uh, but that's hopefully something that we'll be able to answer in the back half of this video. But I uh, just wanted to draw attention to that as considering the architecture of this system, we would have expected to see something shared. Uh, so that is an initial interesting takeaway. So we move down into the bay itself. Uh, Grace, I'd like you to just do a quick top down in here and in terms of packaging, uh, again, with uh, comparisons to something like both the Rivian and to a Tesla, the cooling and thermal systems for an EV tend to be very uh, uh, tightly packaged. There's usually a lot going on. When you look at something like the Tesla, you have a single module that doesn't take up a whole lot of space in the front here that integrates all of your ethylene glycol and your refrigerant cooling. What we see here is uh, certainly a much greater amount of lines overall. And specifically, because this has a heat pump, we're looking at a much greater amount of refrigerant lines uh, throughout the entire uh, front bay here. So from what we've been able to determine from an examination here and some reviews of uh, some thermal management diagrams from the owner's manual, effectively what we have is uh, for the motor loop, we have the main reservoir here that's going to run out, uh, be cooled by the radiator, or uh, it has an option to run through a chiller uh, via a, a directional control valve. Uh, a unique feature of the cooling method for this that we will be verifying during the teardown is it appears that the cooling path, as opposed to a parallel path for handling the front EDM, which is gonna be the front inverter and front motor, and then the rear, uh, inverters would typically be cooled first because of all the heat generated by the uh, IGBTs or uh, silicon carbide MOSFETs, depending on which ones are in use. Uh, that will kick up a lot of heat, so those typically get cooled first, and then the coolant will flow directly into the rotor stator assembly. Uh, what we have here is the coolant is being run through the front inverter, then being fed directly to the rear inverter, then to the rear motor, and then back to the front motor, which you can actually see here is this uh, plate heat exchanger. Once the coolant is uh, flowed through here and the heat is exchanged, we then exit and uh, this goes to our primary uh, chiller assembly. <clears throat> this is where uh, there's an interface between uh, three different loops uh, based off of what we've been able to uh, determine so far. Um, and uh, so that would comprise the overall powertrain loop for the battery loop itself and this is something that's particularly interesting because this is a vehicle that has a heat pump is if you look down in here just underneath uh, this dc dc converter behind these lines there are uh, two high voltage lines running down to a ptc heater this is actually for the coolant coming out of the battery itself so uh, this in conjunction with collecting waste heat from the battery cells as it flows through the pack during use is actually going to add heat if necessary to the coolant exiting the battery pack, at which point this glycol 
will flow into a heat exchanger that exchanges heat with the refrigerant in the suction line of the compressor. So it'll effectively pull heat out from the battery coolant and preheat some of that refrigerant that's going into the compressor so that you can get uh, greater system efficiency. That's one of the aspects of the heat pump. Uh, in addition to the PTC heater for the coolant, there is also up to the right hand side of the dash panel here on the passenger side, there is an additional high voltage cable that is for an internal PTC heater for cabin heating. One thing that we would typically assume is that if a vehicle has a heat pump system, we wouldn't likely see resistive heating elements like this in the vehicle. Uh, however, um, it's just uh, an interesting thing that they have both the complexity and the components integrated into this design for a heat pump, but then they left some of the uh, equipment and features that you would typically see in a vehicle that doesn't have uh, the heat pump system, all of these additional plate heat exchangers and the integration between the glycol and the refrigerant systems. Um, so that's just a brief overview of what we can determine from the architecture so far. Uh, we'll go into a little bit greater detail in uh, just a few minutes, but then um, before we go any further in terms of the material for this, uh, we see what we would uh, typically expect to see with an EV is uh, primarily nylon lines with quick disconnects. However, there are still a number of uh, constant tension band clamps, such as you can see there are two here. This is the coolant line that is connected to the front motor that is uh, then connected to the plate heat exchanger. We have constant tension band clamps there, as well as where we connect to the coolant reservoirs here. Uh, and this appears to be a constant tension band clamp around uh, potentially uh, some thermal uh, insulation in the form of a reinforced rubber tube, which is then right next to a quick connect on a nylon fitting that connects to that reservoir. So that uh, on, on its own is slightly interesting. Um, and then the number of uh, refrigerant lines for the HVAC portion of the system, there are a great many here. However, one thing I will say based off of uh, other similar systems that I've taken a look at for previous projects here at Monroe is the uh, overall uh, length of the individual lines. This is very tightly packaged. No individual line seems to run any longer than it needs to. We have seen instances with various OEMs in some of our projects where due to uh, an internal requirement, um, there is a necessity to have a certain length of the EPDM portion of the line in a continuous segment of uh, one of the AC lines, which just incurs uh, an unnecessary amount of both weight and cost so seeing something here where they have very limited runs of this very heavy and expensive material uh, makes a lot of sense. And it's nice to see that they are not beholden to uh, some arbitrary standard that would dictate that they fill void space with that unneeded cost and weight. So uh, that's the general overview for right now. So uh, in just a few seconds, we'll go ahead and jump over. We'll take a look at the components laid out on the table, and then we'll go into a little more depth uh, about a lot of the components that we can't see here and discuss what's going on inside the battery for the thermal management as well. So stay tuned. Several months later. So we now have the thermal system torn down in its entirety. Uh, I am joined by Alex, one of our co-ops, who's been doing the brunt of the work, getting all of this processed and analyzed for our thermal systems report. So. Alex, just taking a look at the system as a whole, do you want to walk us through uh, just kind of at a high level architecture um, view and then we can go down into some of the unique components that we found? Yeah, that sounds great, absolutely. So the first interesting thing to know as a part of the system is that we see different coolant loops within like different types of thermal systems that we analyze, but this is the first one that Monroe has seen that specifies two different types of coolant for each of the main loops within its system. We have a blue coolant bottle here and a pink coolant bottle the blue coolant bottle connected to the battery loop, which contained a low conductivity coolant, a little bit different, uh, pardon me, different from the typical ethylene glycol mixture, while the pink bottle contained what we would typically see. And that directed all coolant for the powertrain loop, which included inverters, motors, and the ICCU, which is this vehicle's OBC and DC-DC converter all in one. So moving on to different coolant components, we have two different three-way valves that were connected to each loop of the system. This one here was connected to the powertrain loop, directing flow optionally to the external radiator to act for additional cooling. Mm -hmm. 
or we have the secondary three-way pump down there, which connected to the battery manifold and to another one of the coolant pumps that went directly into the battery assembly. Mm -hmm. um, that manifold, as I mentioned before, is right here. This was something that was kind of interesting. I guess when I had seen the Tesla stuff that we had done previously, that was a very directed manifold in terms of, there was a lot of mm -hmm. control right. where different coolant was going to flow. Mm -hmm. And this one has more of a vent flow type system where there's an inlet and an outlet and then three coolant channels mm -hmm. and it just disperses wherever needed within the system. Right, so this manifold is located on the, it was the rear drive unit? It was the front uh, drive The front unit. drive unit. And effectively what this does is it allows uh, coolant to mix within this manifold assembly and effectively uh, this is where the battery loop and then the low temperature uh, radiator loop are allowed to combine in their coolant flow. Um, and uh, one thing, uh, Branching from that to the battery loop mm -hmm. is um, we also had the existence of this battery heater. So the uh, w one of the high level things about this vehicle, uh, the Ionic 5, as well as the Kia EV6, this system is a heat pump system. So there, as we'll go into a little bit later, uh, heat scavenged from the powertrain uh, that is then used for cabin heating. As a consequence of that, for cold weather conditions, there still needs to be some mechanism for heating the battery so that the lithium ion cells are in a comfortable range for charging and discharging without uh, affecting life cycle or causing any potential danger inside the cells. So Alex, do you wanna go ahead and walk us through what we found inside of this, uh, this heater yeah, here? Yeah, absolutely. So this is actually a resistive heating element and I'll pull it out here so you guys can see it, it's pretty simple. It's just kind of a heated coil. And then in here, you'll have a pool of coolant and it'll just simply be heated as electricity mm -hmm. runs through the coil. And after that, it'll be distributed throughout the loop. Mm -hmm. But what's kind of interesting is that this is directly attached to the battery outlet, even though it's intended to heat the battery. Mm -hmm. So they have a separate loop that starts essentially with this heater and then runs through their system. Mm -hmm taking the hot coolant from the heater and directing it back into the battery. Mm -hmm. Though, I guess it seemed like an interesting decision to me from a packaging choice, because it, if you're trying to heat the battery, I, you typically would install the heater at the inlet. So it was an interesting choice to me that they would choose to install it at the outlet and then just allow the coolant f to flow through. Is there any particular reason that they would do that? Um, well, because of how they're running this portion of the circuit, they are able to isolate the battery coolant loop on its own when in battery heating mode based off of what we could tell from the rest of the components in the system. Right. So effectively, I don't think it necessarily matters where the inlet or the outlet is relative to this if it's all going to be um, isolated and just uh, getting heat from this resistive heating element. But typically, at least what we did think at first was that this would be located at the inlet of that system just due to the fact that it's heating the battery. But it's not entirely clear until you or we were able to uh, break down the entire system and look at how everything was interconnected as well as how the different loops function in uh, different scenarios such as the the battery heating. Um, but that, that was uh, definitely an interesting, uh, an interesting find in this system. Rivian, uh, instead of having a true heat pump where the powertrain heat is scavenged for uh, cabin heating, uh, they actually directed powertrain heat through a three-way valve, very similar to what we see uh, right here on the table. And that effectively allowed heated coolant from the powertrain loop to be diverted into the battery for uh, temperature uh, rise and maintaining uh, a, a good uh, temperature in cold weather conditions, which is something that Rivian uh, has gone on record as uh, saying. Uh, the fact that this needs a resistive heating element is uh, purely a byproduct of the fact that they are opting for a true heat pump system where their powertrain waste heat is being used for the uh, cabin side heating. And speaking of that, actually, they have this very unique component that connects both coolant loops within their system. So both types of coolant as well, the low conductivity and the normal ethylene glycol, as well as the refrigerant loop all in one chiller. And as far as I've seen, I haven't seen anything like this before that's able to connect like four different, like two coolant inlets and two coolant outlets as well as refrigerant. So this is a pretty impressive piece. It also has an AC dryer installed onto the side and 
that's kind of interesting as well because they installed a dryer here at the refrigerant outlet that also flows into an accumulator which has a similar function and also allows um, extra condensation from the refrigerant's temperature change to be collected before going into the AC compressor. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, that's just really cool. It's not something that I've seen before and it definitely is very thorough in terms of making sure that your refrigerant is in as pure of a form as possible before it right. enters the compressor and heats up to be a part of that system. Because as soon as it goes into the compressor, it goes into the AC condenser. Right. So yeah, just a little bit more about uh, the heat exchanger here. Uh, this effectively is the crux of how they are managing, uh, uh, Hyundai is managing their heat pump system. Uh, as Alex has already stated, this is where the interface between the high temperature powertrain glycol loop, the, uh, we'll call it mid temperature uh, glycol battery loop, and then the refrigerant circuit all interface. So depending on the condition, say uh, we're in cabin heating mode, the motor uh, circuit, the high temperature glycol circuit, has a valve in it to bypass the radiator, uh, the high temperature radiator. So effectively, we will get a continuous loop of glycol collecting heat from uh, the powertrain components, such as the inverters and the motors and the ICCU. The only heat exchanger that that loop interfaces with when the radiators bypass is this heat exchanger. So effectively, we are flowing increasingly uh, hotter or sorry, coolant into this heat exchanger, which is then able to transfer that heat to the refrigerant loop, which then can be used to heat the cabin. The nice thing about this is the addition of the low temperature circuit in this as well, means that depending on the system requirements for the cabin heating that's being desired, uh, the refrigerant can take as much heat as it needs to achieve that, and then any additional latent heat can be absorbed by the low temperature glycol circuit and expelled through the low temperature radiator at the front of the vehicle. So the system uh, keeps itself in a state of equilibrium depending on the demands of each one of the three circuits that are going into this. So this is a, a very, I think, it's, it's kind of a cool way to do it. It's certainly not uh, anywhere near as complex as the uh, Octavalve or the super manifold that Tesla has been using in their heat pump systems for the past few years. Uh, but just in terms of simplicity and um, the, the way that this is being done, I actually do think that this is pretty neat. Yeah, well even then, um, since you brought up the Octavalve and the specialized manifold mm -hmm. that was made for it for Tesla, that was a very specialized component. Mm -hmm. And if something goes wrong with that component, you end up having to replace that component and your entire system is just going is thrown into whack. Right. So centralizing a component, so even if you have like more things and you have to worry about packaging space in terms of the vehicle, mm -hmm. um, having something that's less specialized allows it to be a lot more replaceable. So you're able to still run your vehicle mm -hmm. the way that it's meant to be ran, right. even if something goes wrong. This is definitely more service friendly than something like a super manifold assembly would be. Uh, if something goes wrong with an individual component, it is, relatively speaking, uh, much easier to replace a single component instead of an entire sub-assembly. Uh, replacement costs are going to be a lot less expensive because a single plate heat exchanger is going to be orders of magnitude less costly than an entire super manifold and octave valve assembly. Um, however, that does, to Alex's point, come with some trade-offs. The super manifold is incredibly compact. It fits very neatly in the front of the vehicle. This obviously takes up a little bit more space. However, it is achievable with uh, components that are, I don't want to say off the shelf, but a little more commonplace among EVs. Uh, if there is not a super high level of uh, integration and upfront design work that's desired, this is uh, much more of a plug and play uh, uh, sort of a system like we saw with Rivian, but sort of taken to the next level with some systems level thinking to achieve a, uh, a high efficiency heat pump system. But with that packaging, Alex, we did also take a look at how many brackets were needed to support all of this hardware in the vehicle, yes. which is another trade-off. Yes, that's very true. There were 12 brackets, several components, including the H-hiller and the accumulator that we mentioned earlier, had at least two brackets in order to be installed onto the body and frame of the vehicle. And that is not optimized for what we would like to see, especially as Monroe, where lead design is our creed. But just in terms of, that's a lot of stamped metal, that's a lot of extra parts that you're paying for, mm -hmm. all the brackets that we took off of this vehicle, well, everyone except one that I can remember, all had coatings as well, mm -hmm. they were all painted. So that's just a lot of production cost 
And if you were to make other fittings that interface directly with the body and frame where most of these components were mounted, that would save you a lot of cost because taking like $2 out of a 100,000 mm -hmm. vehicle run is just, that's millions of dollars. Though something I did want to bring up because I didn't bring that up in my initial overview, mm -hmm. the cooling pack at the start of the system contained two radiators, one for the low temperature battery loop and one for the high temperature powertrain loop, mm -hmm. as well as an additional external condenser to assist with the cooling cycle. I know we mentioned the high temperature radiator right. a couple of times yeah. and I, I should have mentioned that beforehand nope. just so everyone yeah. was on the same page. Thank you for the context. Um, uh, but yeah, moving on to kind of heat exchangers, mm -hmm. there was an additional heat exchanger within the battery loop that we've called the bee chiller. Mm -hmm. This interfaced directly with battery coolant as well as refrigerant, but it was only enabled to be used for battery cooling whenever the expansion valve was open. Mm -hmm. So this acts as both an expansion valve and a control valve. It was installed directly at the inlet of the bee chiller, so no refrigerant was allowed into the bee chiller to assist with cooling the battery unless this was opened. Um, I've attached the actuator on the bottom so we can see the inside. I want to make sure that it's on the right angle. So tilting it to the side, oh, pardon me, I think I moved a little bit too fast. You should be able to see, yeah, the line that's across it, that groove, that actually grows deeper from its state at the beginning where it's solid and flat. So, pardon me. I'm gonna reattach it here. Yeah. At this angle, it's completely closed. So at this point, no flow would be allowed into the bee chiller. But as it tilts to the side, that indent grows deeper and allows more coolant, pardon me, refrigerant to be allowed into the bee chiller. And that pressure can be controlled. And since the AC system is all about pressure and when the refrigerant is at a certain pressure, it's able to absorb more of the heat from the system. It's able to act as a very control, in a very controlled form to allow the bee chiller to extract as much heat as possible to cool the battery whenever it's needed. Right, because the battery itself, as we mentioned earlier, the only interface that the battery glycol loop has with a radiator to the front of the vehicle is through this manifold. Yes. And through the mixing of the coolant between uh, the low temperature radiator loop and the battery loop. So. Uh, in addition to that, this chiller is effectively the primary way for the battery itself to be cooled. Um, I think as far as the uh, glycol portion of the circuit uh, is concerned, the last thing that we wanted to touch on before going into a little bit of uh, the refrigerant side, just to cap things off, is in terms of uh, cooling for the components themselves. So the EDMs to the front and rear both were cooled using a uh, heat exchanger mounted to the outside, very similar to what we saw on the Tesla Model S Plaid, uh, very dissimilar to what we saw on the Rivian R1T with direct glycol cooling in jackets inside of the EDM housings themselves and the inverters. However, one thing that uh, was done in a rather unique way for the Ionic and also the EV6 uh, was this inverter, which you can see uh, glycol fittings here for flow in and out of the housing on the inside we can see these uh, channels here and here and there's actually a cavity below this machine surface where there's a uh, thermal interface material to enable greater heat transfer from the uh, components inside the inverter so if you take a look at the front this is actually a hollow channel inside here and as opposed to what we've seen on different applications such as the inverter from the tesla model s plaid the model y uh, this is the inverter Tesla's been using for the past few years. They have a torturous path with uh, cooling fins inside here closed out with a plate that's fastened on with threaded fasteners. Likewise, this is a DC-DC converter from the F-150 Lightning, again with a path for coolant flow closed out with a fastened plate and some form of a seal. As opposed to doing something like that, they've actually friction stir welded on closeout plate uh, so they've effectively eliminated fasteners, uh, integrated the cover for this into the inverter housing itself uh, because effectively there's no reason to need to remove that or service it if it's purely providing a channel for coolant flow. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that was one thing that stood out to us as uh, comparatively a, a pretty unique execution between the uh, uh, powertrain uh, component cooling between some of these vehicles.
Yeah, I'd say additionally, it is good to note that the front and rear inverter on the Ionic were actually cooled in two different ways. Mm -hmm. This is the rear inverter here, and I've taken the coolant assembly from the front inverter in order to show you here. And all of the IGBT modules were lined up within this channel here and then sandwiched in between both the inlet and outlet of this coolant channel, so that way they could get the most direct cooling possible. And you can kind of see a little bit on the edges, but that kind of like um, that white residue, mm -hmm. that's all thermal paste. So they greased the entirety of the inside of these two coolant tubes and then sandwiched all the components that needed the most cooling together. Mm -hmm. So that way they had the most direct results possible. Right. And that is something that we actually saw on the F-150 as well in terms of cooling some of their electronic components. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I think, yeah, uh, just as the last couple of things to talk about with some of our refrigerant uh, components here. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about what we saw cabin side in terms of evaporator, condenser, and then their PTC heater? Yeah. Um, I'll move a little bit over here so that way we can identify those a little bit more clearly. Here we have the internal condenser and then our evaporator and finally our PTC heater. And all three of these were within the HVAC module as a whole. So the inner condenser acts as the first element that actually heats the cabin from the AC loop. It takes direct refrigerant from the AC compressor and then pulls it right into the cabin. Um, this fin-like structure, tube and fin, is able to exchange heat with the internal air of the cabin and the vehicle. And because all of this just came out of the AC compressor, it is super, super hot. It's able to exchange heat with the inside and eventually the refrigerant that leaves this, oh, pardon me, it's like through this too. Um, that'll all be like room temperature and then it will change form. So it's in more of kind of like a gaseous and somewhat liquid state at this point. But yeah, this is gonna be super hot air going directly into your cabin. After that, it runs through, well, technically it goes out to the external condenser and then back again. But the other primary thing that's going to be cool in your cabin is going to be this evaporator. And this is a very, thick one. I don't think I've seen an evaporator that has this much tube and fin cooling direct before. So that's pretty impressive. And this again has an inlet and outlet that is going to act in kind of the opposite way of the condenser. Mm -hmm. It's going to heat up the refrigerant within it so that way it expels cold air to the inside. Mm -hmm. And this is the primary way that they're going to be chilling the cabin. Right. Both of these are actually active because the internal condenser goes straight from the AC compressor. So this is active in every single variation of the AC loop. However, they have a blend door within the HVAC module that's able to run in between these two. And direct flow, if you want like a hotter cabin, it's going to allow most of the air from the internal condenser to go through. Well, if you want a colder cabin, it's going to allow most of the air from the evaporator to go through. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty ingenious system where mm -hmm. they're able to, they don't have to change the way that they're flowing their AC modules and they're still able to have optimal cooling within. Right. And uh, I think one thing that's uh, sort of the elephant in the room with this system, and I think the last monument that we'll speak to in terms of the overall system architecture is the PTC heater, which is located in the cabin. Uh, yes, this vehicle does have a heat pump, and yes, it does also have a cabin side PTC heater. Uh, this was something that at first we were not expecting to see. Uh, however, this is, uh, I believe, co-located uh, effectively right after the inner condenser. Uh, so uh, this, likely was included for a number of reasons, uh, very likely related to performance of heating the cabin in cold weather. Uh, due to, um, compared to an ICE vehicle, the limitations of a heat pump system in terms of the speed with which it can increase cabin temperature to a certain point within a certain threshold of time, it's somewhat limited. So having a PTC heater effectively means that the cabin can be brought up to temperature very quickly and then rely on the condenser for sort of steady state uh, heat maintenance for the cabin. Um, so we did see a PTC heater in the Rivian and also in older model Teslas where there was no heat pump system and this was the primary method for heating the cabin. One advantage to what Ionic's doing here is even though they do have the inclusion of an additional component here, and yes, this is going to eat some of your high voltage battery range in order to operate, having it work in conjunction with the inner condenser means that on average, the duty cycle for the cabin PTC heater is going to be lower, which means that this will actually have to work less hard than in a pure PTC heating application which means that you sort of get a little bit the best of both worlds. You're not eating up as much range, but you still get to maintain decent uh, temperature 
uh, increase within the cabin within a uh, still fairly minimal amount of time. You're not necessarily going to feel any kind of, um, uh, it's not gonna be as noticeable that it's running off of a heat pump as opposed to uh, something with a PTC or heating in an ice vehicle. Yeah, um, it is definitely a best of both worlds thing because PTC heaters, because they're high voltage components, directly impact your battery capacity. Right. So at first when I saw that there were two heating elements within the system, I was like, oh no. Mm -hmm. I it's, <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a balance between uh, performance and efficiency and definitely what they have set up here for likely what their internal requirements are for cabin heating. Uh, it seems to be, it's a, it's a compromise for sure, yeah. uh, but ultimately it's one that's not going to uh, cost them uh, too, too much. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm very surprised and really happy with the way that it's implemented because they're able to, they, they use the heaters only when they have to. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing that is reliant in the system on the heater in order to function. Even the battery heater, as we saw earlier, acts as a additional function when the powertrain is not able to heat the battery enough for mm -hmm. optimum, optimal um, charging conditions, right. like winter mode. So it's, it's really cool to see proper utilization of PTCs within EVs. This is really awesome. Well, I think that about covers uh, all of the components, unless we're forgetting anything. Um, uh, did we want to talk about the battery tray at all? Um, yeah, I think very briefly, uh, part of the glycol loop um, and something that we'll touch on uh, when uh, I believe Antonio and I will be doing the battery video itself. But a bit of a sneak peek is the integrated heat exchanging plate that is actually integral to the structure of the battery pack itself. Um, so in terms of an overall thermal management system, when we consider what's inside the pack, uh, you can see there, there's no need for any nylon lines and that eliminates leak pads inside the battery. Uh, so we'll go into more detail on that when we do a full breakdown of the battery. Um, but yeah, thank you. That is just another aspect of this uh, system where um, to the battery, it's relatively easy to interface with the thermal management system. Yeah. Um, but outside Everything of that, point, yeah. yeah. So, so outside of that, I think we've just about covered everything. Um, so thank you for watching. And if you are interested, uh, as I mentioned before, Alex has been analyzing this entire system and working very diligently to generate our thermal systems report for the Ionic 5. If that is something that you or your organization would be interested in, uh, feel free to reach out to sales at leandesign.com and we'll be able to provide that for you. So thank you very much for watching and thank you, Alex, for getting everything set up and walking us through this. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you very much.